What is the common denominator between buildings on land and ships at ocean in terms of major disasters? Both can be subjected to strong wave action. We have ground waves motion during earthquakes on land and high ocean waves during storms that ceased. During this nature-induced events, both building and ships can succumb to major or catastrophic damages. The strong earthquake that hit Myanmar on March 28, 2025 recorded a magnitude of 7.7. At Bangkok, Thailand which is 600 plus miles away, the earthquake magnitude is already lesser. But still, the building under construction still collapsed. Why? Welcome back. We had mentioned on previous vlog that the tower crane killed this building. Some comments have doubts, so this update, we will explain why we said the tower crane killed that building. Before anything else, please hit like and subscribe. The earthquake hypocenter was recorded as around 10 kilometers below epicenter. The epicenter is the point on the ground surface and hypocenter or the focus is the exact location below ground epicenter where the earthquake occurred. As mentioned earlier, the seismic waves traveled more than 600 miles toward Bangkok, Thailand. This wave traveling dissipates the seismic energy that is why the magnitude at Bangkok should be lesser already. Due to this reduced magnitude, no major failure were observed on existing buildings. But still the building collapsed. As the earthquake's seismic energy are released from hypocenter, it generated wave motion on the ground. This is similar to how waves are generated at seas or ocean. This waves we can see ripple effect at the ground surface. This ripples are what we see as ground breakages or damages. Now, we just beginning the technical explanation. What are the four types of earthquakes? The four types of earthquakes are tectonic, volcanic, collapse, and explosion. Tectonic earthquakes are the result of tectonic plate movement. Volcanic earthquakes are the result of a slip of a fault near a volcano. What are the four types of ground seismic waves? Seismic waves can be classified into two basic types, body waves which travel through the earth and surface waves which travel along the earth's surface. Those waves that are the most destructive are the surface waves which generally have the strongest vibration. Now we're going open water or offshore. When sea or ocean going vessels or ships faces the elements of sea and weather, these are subjected to six types of movement or motion forces generated or induced by the sea wave, current, wind, mechanical action and combination of these. What are the six ships' motions? And let's understand its cause and effects. Every ship at sea faces the constant challenge of balancing forces from waves, wind, and currents. These forces create six unique motions that determine how a ship moves and reacts in different conditions. This video will provide a clear and detailed explanation of the following motions. Roll. Pitch. Yaw. Surge. Sway. And heave. Breaking down their causes, effects, and differences. The six motions of a ship occur primarily along three axes of motion. The longitudinal axis, also known as the fore and aft axis, is commonly referred to as the x-axis. The transverse axis, also known as the port and starboard axis, is commonly referred to as the y-axis. Lastly, the vertical axis, also known as the up and down axis, is commonly referred to as the z-axis. All six motions of the vessel take place along or around these three axes. Let's start with the ship's motion known as roll. Roll is the tilting motion of a ship from side to side, port to starboard, around its longitudinal axis, also known as the fore and aft axis or x-axis. This motion is caused by waves acting on the beam, the side of the ship. Roll typically occurs when a ship is broadside to waves, causing it to tilt alternately toward the port and starboard sides. The extent of this motion is measured in degrees. The next motion of a ship is pitch. Pitch is the up and down tilting motion of the ship, around its transverse axis, the port to starboard axis, or the y-axis. 
This motion occurs when waves strike the ship head-on or from the stern. A ship experiences pitch when navigating through head seas, with the bow rising on a wave crest and then falling into a trough. It is measured in degrees to quantify the angle of tilt between the bow and stern relative to the horizontal plane. The next motion of the ship is yaw. Yaw is the side-to-side -side motion of the ship about its vertical axis, or z-axis. This motion is caused by uneven forces acting on the bow or stern, such as waves or rudder adjustments. Yaw represents the angular deviation of the ship's heading around its vertical axis, or z-axis. It is measured as the angle between the ship's current heading and its intended or reference course, so the unit of measurement is in degrees. The next motion of the ship is surge. Surge is the forward and backward motion of the ship along its longitudinal axis, or x-axis. This motion is primarily caused by changes in speed or thrust, such as when the engine accelerates or decelerates, or engine power variation, and due to large waves or wave impact on the bow or stern. A ship surges when encountering head seas, as waves alternately push and resist the vessel's forward motion. The unit measurement of surge for the linear forward or backward motion along the x-axis can be meter, centimeter, or millimeter. But for the unit of velocity, it can be meter per second, centimeter per second, or millimeter per second. Another motion of the ship is sway. Sway is the side-to-side -side motion of the ship along its transverse axis, the port and starboard axis, or along the y-axis. This is often caused by lateral forces like wind or currents acting on the side of the hull. A ship also sways when it experiences crosswinds or maneuvering sideways in a harbor using thrusters. The unit measurement of sway is the same as surge. And the last motion of the ship is heave. Heave is the vertical motion of the ship along its vertical axis, the up and down axis, or the z-axis. It is caused by the lifting and falling effect of waves. A ship experiences heave when sailing through a high swell, as it is lifted by the crest and drops into the trough of a wave. The unit measurement is the same as surge and sway. What is the common denominator between seismic earthquake movement at ground and wave motion at seas? It's the six degrees of motion forces, cited as roll, pitch, yaw, surge, sway, heave, all are generated in acting on the building or ship due to the motion of waves either at ground or at seas. Let's review Newton's laws of motion. 1. Newton's first law of motion inertia, an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at constant speed, and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. 2. Newton's second law of motion force, the acceleration of an object, depends on the mass of the object and the amount of force applied. 3. Newton's third law of motion action and reaction, whenever one object exerts a force on another object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Example 1. Cargoes on ships. During ship voyage, cargoes must be kept secure regardless if ships are traversing calm water or rough seas. Here, the calm or rough seas exerts varying motion forces on the ship. In return, the ship exerts equal and opposite forces on the cargoes. This is in accordance to Newton's third law of motion. If the motion forces are large and cargoes are not tied securely, it can fall exerting an equal and opposite forces to the ship. Damages can happen or worse, the ship can overturn and capsize. Accordingly, the ship remains stable in constant traveling speed, unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force, example, sudden rough waves or sudden engine stoppage, or worse, ship collisions. This is in accordance to Newton's first law of motion. Ship cargoes must be secured. This is called sea fastening. The design for sea fastening is dictated by the type and size of ship, the mass slash weight of cargo and the position of the cargo on the ship. The six degrees of motion acted on the ship by the sea waves generates forces and inertia acceleration. This is in accordance to Newton's second law of motion. Take a look on this cargo ship. Following Newton's law of motions. The cargoes are secured by sea fastenings, the heavier and farther away 
the center of mass or gravity of cargoes referenced from ship's center of flotation cough, the stronger are the required sea fastening will be. The detailed design of sea fastenings will not be discussed here. Also, note that the farther away the cargoes are located from a midship, the stronger inertia forces will be induced on it by the ship's motion. As per Newton's law, it will generate an equal, but opposite reactions, is then impacting the ship. This inertia forces generated by cargoes, if not properly addressed by sea fastenings, can cause the cargoes to fall out of ship, or worse, can bring the ship to capsize. Here is example number two. Newton's law of motions also applies here. Cabinets inside buildings, if not fastened stable or secured, during earthquake, these can easily tumble and fall down, as we can see in the photo. Let's now focus on main subject of review, the climbing tower crane. We confirmed from the photo. The climbing tower crane is positioned on a wall shaft. This shaft may be a service elevator shaft or anything else of purpose. Have a look of a sample video. Shaft climbing tower crane. The crane have lower support at base and upper support assembly. These allows crane to climb inside a shaft and locked into place at walls pockets when being used for lifting. It will climb stage by stage together with the rising of building floors until it reached the top. The climbing crane is already at the topmost level when this building collapsed due to earthquake. Climbing crane is positioned in this elevator shaft. The elevator shaft, as per plan drawing, is carrying the floor framings probably all floors levels. This shaft is located at the farther rightmost corner of the building. The shaft cores acts as main building's sheer walls that resist lateral movement due to strong wind and earthquake, for whatever of a reason of perhaps overlooked. They positioned the climbing crane on this corner shaft. This elevator shaft, now loaded with the floor framing's weight, and also the weight of the climbing crane, located at the top. When earthquake occurred, this shaft is now subjected to earthquake-induced dynamically increased loading from top down to its base. Again, we state that the farther away the cargoes or equipment are located from a midship or mass center of building, the stronger inertia forces will be induced on it by the ship or building motion due to sea waves or ground waves motion. As per Newton's law, the climbing crane is now induced into motion by building sway due to earthquake. It generates an equal but opposite reactions now impacting the shaft of the building. As per Newton's law of motion for inertia, once an object is set into motion, it will require an unbalanced force to bring it back to resting stage. However, the crane sling and hook block moving wildly in the air also added an increased dynamic oscillating swaying motion of the crane. Now we conclude. The elevator core shaft carries the floor framings. It also carried the climbing crane. All these combined weight are dynamically magnified by earthquake. The climbing crane position from far corner and at top easily can generate back to GS inertia forces while it's under that induced inertia force. It continued oscillating back and forth, the core wall carrying it eventually succumbed to overloading stress. Somewhere in the building framing connections, weak links snapped and then the domino collapsed unsued. Now, it's all but history. Hard lessons will be learned here. Rest in peace to those departed in this sad event. Thank you for having me. God bless us all. Thank <laughs> you.